Hello again. Today I'm going to talk to you about form in music. And just for sake of reference, I'm working from page 49 into page 50 and 51 of the ninth brief edition of Hamian, Music and Appreciation. Okay, so first maybe we should think back to our original definition of music. Always good to review these things. And that definition was that music was the art of organizing sounds in time. And the organizing is obviously a big, uh, important point. And anytime we organize something, we are forming it. We are taking something which maybe is formless and imposing a form upon it. So actually every decision that a composer or a songwriter makes has to do with form. So if I, if I choose to use one note, but not another note, I choose to use a certain rhythm, but not another rhythm. If I choose a certain chord, but not a different chord, I am making formal decisions. So form can be thought to exist on many different levels in a piece of music, or I mean, you can think about this in, in lots of other uh, things which have form, right? You can think of a, uh, a building that has individual bricks that have to be formed. Uh, and then there are walls made up of those bricks. There are sections within the building, right? There are different systems within the building. Think of the human body also. You've got individual cells which have a form, and then even within those cells you have organelles and whatnot. Uh, and then those cells make up certain tissues, and those tissues form into organs, and the organs are part of systems like your digestive system, your cardiopulmonary system, your nervous system. And then ultimately there is the macro form, the form of the entire human body. So uh, we have the same thing in music. We have individual notes. Uh, we have, let's say, phrases. We have sections of a piece of music. And then we have the entire work itself. Um, those little individual notes could be th thought of as micro level form, but then there are various mid levels until we get up to the macro level. Usually when musicians or music professors talk about musical form, we're talking about the arrangement of sections within a piece of music. So we're talking sort of more on the macro level. Um, and these sections are differentiated from each other because there's some kind of a change from one section to the next. It could be a drastic change, it could be a subtle change, but it's, it, it's going to be different enough that we recognize, oh, this is different from that. And it's gonna vary tremendously from one piece to another, from one era to another. But all music has this, all music has form. It's one of those things, again, like so many other aspects of music theory that I've talked about, that you probably already understand on a subconscious or intuitive level, maybe uh, rather than on a conscious level. You might never, not have ever listened to a piece of music and thought about its form, but maybe after this lecture you will. Uh, okay, so no matter what form a piece of music is in, or who the composer is, there's one basic principle at work. Right? And it has to do with the fact that, first of all, we have a, a, a form of art that exists in time. Right? And because it exists in time, we need to have some, some continuity. Right? We need to, for example, hear things repeated once in a while, so that the entire work existing in time, so that things that we've heard before we recall later, so that the entire work has a sense of cohesion or unity to it. So one of the most important aspects of form is repetition. Repetition creates this feeling of continuity and unity. But obviously if we have too much repetition, if we simply repeat over and over again, then the audience is gonna become bored and that's no good either. So we need to also have some variety. We need to have contrast. What happens if we have too much variety, too much contrast? Let's say we had a bunch of different sections in a piece of music and each was very different from the other and nothing was ever repeated. Well, then the listener might become kind of confused or bewildered 
and it might start to think, well, this doesn't really sound like one unified artwork. This sounds like five or six different things kind of randomly stitched together. So um, repetition and variety are both good things, even though they're opposites, they're both good things, but we have to strike some kind of balance between the two of them. We can't have all one or all the other. So this is what a composer does when they're trying to come up with the form of a piece of music. They are balancing out two competing goods. And those are, again, repetition, which creates a feeling of continuity and imposes some unity on our artwork, but also variety, which gives us some contrast and maintains our interest. Now, the book describes these in slightly different terms than I do, but um, big, important words in bold type, uh, repetition and contrast. Then we also have the possibility of repetition and contrast going on simultaneously. And this is what we call variation. Um, one of the most popular forms in music is theme and variation form. And this is when we are presented with a theme at the beginning. And then we are presented with variations of that theme in sequence, as many variations as the composer feels like giving us. And in each of those variations, some aspect or aspects of the theme are changed. Maybe the uh, texture is changed, or maybe the melody is altered somewhat, or maybe the harmony is changed, maybe the mode is changed, maybe the rhythm is changed, maybe the orchestration is changed if it's an orchestral piece. Lots of different aspects, elements of music that we could change, but we have to maintain some of the original theme as we go from one variation to the next. We can't change everything or we'll lose the thread. So um, we'll see actually several different examples of theme and variation form as we go through the course, but we actually have already had one uh, here in this first unit, and that is The Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra by Benjamin Britten. Um, we had that piece appearing in your listening back when we were looking at the different instruments. And that piece happens to be in theme and variation form. There's a theme, and then there's a series of variations. And uh, one of the things that changes in those variations is the orchestration, because Britton is trying to show us uh, the different instruments of the orchestra. So that's an example of variation form, which combines repetition and contrast simultaneously. The book goes on to talk about some other types of musical form, like binary form, ternary form, and we will be looking at those forms and many others as we go through the semester. We're not going to do so much of that right now. Right? Since we're going to do it later on, I'm not going to trouble you with it right now. So I'm not going to ask you on this test, what is binary form or what is ternary form? What I'm really expecting is just that you understand the principle behind form, which is, again, this need to balance out two competing goods. Continuity, which is provided by repetition, and variety, or contrast. Right. Um, now, what I thought I might do instead is give some examples of forms that you might be familiar with already. If you listen to any kind of popular music, meaning music that you would hear on the radio, whether it's a country station or uh, a pop station, a rock station, blues, whatever, there's one particular form, at least one, maybe one or two, that you are already probably pretty familiar with because this form is used over and over and over again with sometimes slight changes or variations um, but uh, it's, it's used and has been used for an awful long time. Sometimes it's called American Popular Song Form. And I've got one of my high-tech visual aids here to show you what popular song form is all about. Let's say you're listening to some song on the radio. What's the first thing you hear? Well, it might be just sort of some kind of an introduction, an intro. Right? And... 
this might be just played by the instruments before the singer starts to sing. Now I put it in parentheses here, the word intro, because it's optional. It doesn't necessarily have to be there. Right? And then once the intro is over, what's the, what's the first thing you hear? It's the first verse of the song. Right? And then after that verse, we hear the first chorus of the song. And we can tell the difference between the verse and the chorus. Something changes. Uh, after that first chorus, we normally get another verse. Okay? Now, the verses, although the, the, the notes repeat from one verse to the next, the words are different. So we have some, some continuity and some variety right there. When we get to the second chorus, we notice that not only are the notes the same as the first chorus, but the words are the same as well. Right. Now, look what's happening in this pattern. So intro may or may not be there. Verse, chorus, verse, chorus. This pattern is starting to get kind of predictable. So this is where usually we have something different. And that something different is usually called the bridge. The bridge could just be a different section, or it could maybe be a, let's say it's a rock song, could be a guitar solo or something like that, but we have to have something different at this spot so that it doesn't get too predictable, right? After that bridge, we normally have either another verse and another chorus, or sometimes we skip over that third verse and we go directly to the last chorus. And then after that last chorus, we ha might have a concluding section. In fact, there might be a, a, a fade out, right? That concluding section, after that final chorus, uh, we might call the coda. That's sort of a musical technical term for the concluding section of a piece. It's just like the conclusion of an essay. In fact, this form might be looked at as something like, you know, we see these kind of forms in essays. We have an introductory paragraph, and then we have several paragraphs of the main body. And then, in conclusion, that's what the coda's job is. Right? A coda is simply a concluding section of any piece of music. It actually comes from the Italian word for tail. Uh, so it's the tail on the dog. And again, it may not be there. So I've got it in parentheses. Okay, now, here's how, as a music theorist, as a professor... If I was teaching a music theory class and we had a song in that form, here's how I might diagram it. When we diagram form, we use letters like A's and B's and C's uh, in order to differentiate those different sections. And again, uh, we might have an intro, and I'll put that in parentheses, because it's not essential. It's not an essential part of the structure. Right? So... Now, the first thing we hear, we'll just call it A, letter A. The first different thing we hear, we'll call that letter B. That represents the first chorus. When we get around to our second verse, it's letter A again, but notice I put a little sort of apostrophe there. That's, I'm, I'm calling that A prime. And I'm calling it that because it's not exactly the same as A because the words are different. So it's it's very close to A. It's obviously meant to sound like A, but there is a slight difference in that the words have changed, so I'm going to call it A prime. When I get to the chorus, notice I don't have that prime there because normally the choruses have the exact same words and the exact same melody going on. The bridge, I'm going to call a C section because it's different from anything I've heard before. And then we have a return of a verse, and I'm going to call that a double prime, because it's, again, slightly different from both of the previous verses, obviously similar as well, but different in, the, in that the words have changed. And then our final chorus, B. So we would say it's A, B, A, B, C, A, B. And then again, we might have that coda on the end, but that, since that's not a structurally essential part of this form. I'm putting it in parentheses and I'm not giving it a letter. Right? So this is how we diagram form in music. And so you're going to be seeing some of this uh, as we go through and do uh, and analyze specific works that are in specific forms from specific eras by specific composers. Here's the thing though. I don't want you to, uh, when I do something like this, let's say in the future, right, in a, in a future lecture, 
I don't want you to just memorize A's and B's and C's, some kind of alphabet soup. The purpose of something like this is for you to get the principle of how it works. How, for example, oh, we have some things repeating, some things repeating exactly, but other things repeating with, with some slight difference. We have a pattern, right? And as that pattern becomes predictable, we have some kind of a change, and all this reflects this need for variety and familiarity. So uh, I will use diagrams like that because I want you to actually understand how the form works, not because I want you to memorize a string of letters so that you can spit it back at me at a test or answer correctly on a test. Another thing I, I want you to be careful of is that I don't want you to think that, for example, form consists of the arrangement of verses and choruses. Not all music has verses and choruses. Popular songs do, but there's an awful lot of music out there that, for example, is, is not for singers. There are no words, there's no verses and choruses. So it's not about the verses and choruses, it's what the verses and choruses represent, which are sections that are either going to be similar or the same and are repeated or recalled periodically, or are different and thus provide Variety, right? So remember the principle at work, variety versus continuity. Okay, um, while we're on that subject, though, when they talk about, for example, binary and ternary forms, since we are going to be looking at these forms in the future, um, what kind of a form do you suppose binary would be? Must have two of something, right? Like a bicycle or like binary computer language, which is made up of ones and zeros. Um, and that's... That's true. In a piece in binary form, we have an A section and we have a B section. You might think, okay, that makes sense, except, wait a minute, where's your repetition? How are you going to get a sense of familiarity if you only have two sections? Yeah, you've got variety because the two sections are different, but where do you get your familiarity from? Good question. Uh, well, you get that because each of those sections is repeated, is actually played through twice. So binary form is really A, A, B, B. Right? Very simple type of form, and, and you hear it all over the place, actually. Maybe not so much in popular music, but in, it's, in classical music, we hear it in all different eras, really, because it's such a simple idea. Another uh, very common form is ternary form. Now, the word ternary might not be all that familiar to you, but it basically it works the same way as binary. But whereas binary means having two of something, ternary means having three of something. Hmm, so that must mean that ternary form is like A, B, C? No. Because that would give you, again, that would give you variety, but not any continuity, because none of those sections it, it repeats. Ternary form actually works like this. You have an A section, you have a contrasting B section, and then you have a return of the A section. So ternary form is A, B, A. And this again is another very popular form uh, that goes back a long time. Uh, another form actually that you might be familiar with uh, and this demonstrates a point that I uh, meant to make earlier that sometimes it's the harmony of a piece of music that determines the form or is closely related to the form. Um, some of you might be familiar with 12 bar blues. So this is a musical form. And well, what are the 12 bars? Those are 12 measures, right? So bar is another word for measure. Now, does that mean that a song that is in 12 bar blues is only 12 measures long? No, it's that this 12 measure structure repeats over and over again, as many times as the musicians feel like repeating it. And they sometimes make that decision just sort of on the fly by looking at each other and deciding whether to, to go for another round through those 12 bars or not. In 12 bar blues, the 12 bars go like this. You have four bars of the tonic chord. Right? So we're staying on the same harmony of the tonic chord, the one chord for four bars. Uh, and then we have two bars of the four chord, the subdominant chord. And then we go back to two bars of the tonic chord. So, so far that's eight bars. 
After this, we have the, the ninth bar is the dominant chord, the five chord. And then we have a measure of the four chord. That's measure 10. Measure 11 goes to the one chord. And then the 12th measure, it depends. If we're going to end, then we stay on that one chord. Because remember, in a piece of tonal music, whether it's 12 bar blues or a piece by Beethoven, we have to start and end on that tonic chord, on the one chord. Right? Actually, we don't necessarily need to start on it. We definitely need to start in the key uh, and end in the same key, whatever key we choose. But we usually start on the tonic chord, and we definitely have to end on the tonic chord. That's a definite... Uh, ending point for us. But when we get to that 12th measure of 12 bar blues, we might decide to go around again, remember, and do another run through those 12 bars, which means that we might decide to, to uh, lead to the 5 chord on that 12th measure. If we decide to go to the 5 chord instead of the, the tonic chord, that means we're going around again, because the 5 chord, its function is to lead to 1. So we'll run through those 12 bars as many times as we feel like. When it gets to that last time through, though, we will definitely end on the, the one chord, the tonic chord. What I'll do is I'll put a uh, link up, either in D2L or here on, on YouTube, to a couple of songs that will be in that popular song form that I talked about, and uh, maybe something in 12-bar blues. And... Uh, what I want you to do is just start paying attention to form in the music that you listen to. I mean, certainly, I want you to, to listen to the examples in the book as well. But start paying attention to these things and seeing if you can figure out the form in music that you listen to uh, just for pleasure. Um, in fact, I think it, it might be a good idea to do that with all of these different elements of music uh, that we're learning about to help you understand them better and really to help you get more out of the music. Of course, I think most of us experience music primarily on an emotional level, and that's just fine. That's really what the, that's what the, the intent is, I think, of most musicians. They want to reach us emotionally. But that doesn't mean that we can't also understand it intellectually. And since we're here in a college class uh, looking at music, that's really what we are more interested in. And I think you will, uh, first of all, you'll appreciate your own music that much more if you examine uh, what is it that makes it tick, I think. Um, I remember once uh, when I was about your age, and uh, I was a music major, but during the summers, I, I worked actually as a, a maintenance guy, a painter, at a nursing home. And my boss there knew I was a music major in college and, and liked music, but didn't really know anything about it. That is, he never learned to read music or play an instrument. He said to me, you know, uh, I mean, that's great, you know so much about music, but I'd be worried if I, if I studied it and, and knew too much about it, it would ruin the enjoyment for me. Uh, I guess sort of like, you know, if you ever took a, a trip to a, a slaughterhouse, it might ruin eating hamburgers and steaks for you. But I told him, and I'll tell you, actually, it's just the opposite. The more I understand about music, the more amazing it is to me, and the more I appreciate it. Uh, so... Uh, try and get in the habit of, of noticing these different elements of music, for example, form. And I think you'll not only do better in this class, but you'll get more out of the music that you listen to. All right, before I, I let you go, I want to talk about one other thing that is here in this book as we get to the very end of the unit. And that is, over here on page 54, we have this section on musical style. Okay. And in this section, they give a definition of style. Style refers to a characteristic way of using melody, rhythm, tone, color, dynamics, harmony, texture, and form. Um, and I think, again, style, it's a, it's a word that we all know what it means, and yet it's so hard to define. Um, so we are going to be going through and looking at different eras in music history and looking at styles of not, not only certain eras, but of certain composers, right? We can, we can say that the styles are sort of like the practices of any given era or person in, in music history or in, in art, in 
any field of human endeavor. There's, there are styles, and you can kind of think of style as sort of like guidelines, almost a rule book. And if you are trying to work within a given style, you kind of have to conform to the rules of that style, at least to a large extent. Um, because if you don't, then it's not going to sound like that style anymore. It's going to start to sound like a different style. And sometimes we might have a nice blending, a mix of styles, borrowing something from one style or from another style. Right? But this can also sometimes cause uh, problems or contradictions. So, for example, uh, rock music. Now, that's a big, broad category, uh, even though rock music, as we understand, has really only been around for about the last, what, 60 or 70 years, which is just a blink of an eye in music history. But um, rock has a certain style, let's say. It came out of the 50s and 60s, and part of this style is, that, well, it's, it's kind of simple, sometimes even sort of primitive, and it's aimed at young people. It's not meant to be overly sophisticated, right? Uh, and it's, uh, it has other elements of style. For example, almost every rock song is in quadruple meter. Um, the subjects, the subject matter of the words is limited to a few things. Uh, it doesn't usually go into very deep philosophical issues or whatever. I mean, there's like love songs and party songs and songs about rock and roll and whatever, right? There's songs about cars by the Beach Boys and, um, and the instrumentation, for example, the style of rock, well, you've got to have a drum set, got to have a guitar, really, probably got to have a bass player and a singer, you know, that's sort of like the standard format. And yes, there are some bands that have maybe a keyboard player or a saxophone player, but there's sort of that core. And if you don't have that, it just doesn't sound like rock anymore. It might be something else, might be something good, but it isn't rock. Um, when we get into the 70s, let's say, and you have the era of progressive rock, 70s and 80s, Certain uh, rock bands tried to be more sophisticated. I'm thinking of maybe like uh, Genesis or Rush. And, uh, and I love Genesis and Rush myself. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them, but uh, just taking Rush, for example, that often in their songs, they use unusual meters. Like instead of the same old 4-4, they'll, they'll have something in 7-4 or 5-4. Um, and the lyrics of Rush songs are often sort of very deep and philosophical, right? But for some people, that's kind of a turnoff because it starts to sound too sophisticated and it doesn't sound like rock anymore. And there's sort of a reaction to that. So the reaction to, I, th I think you could make the case, that the, the reaction to progressive rock, um, the rebelling against it was punk. And punk goes back to the very elemental, very simple. If you listen to like the Ramones, you know. Um, another reaction, maybe a little later on, was grunge. If you're familiar with grunge, uh, when things started sounding grungy and simple and uh, rebellious again, instead of sophisticated and very deep and philosophical. Okay, so all of those are kind of aspects of style. One thing I want to mention, though, is we have these dates of these different eras listed here, and we are going to look at each of these eras. Now, we won't get into the 20th century or 1945 to present. We are going to look at uh, the next four tests are going to be about these five eras, the Middle Ages, Renaissance, Baroque, Classical, and Romantic eras. All right? And our next chapter is actually going to be on two of these eras combined. So that's why we're covering five eras in only four tests, right? For now, for this test, I don't need for you to know these dates of these eras, okay? I will need for you to know them when we actually get to these units and study these eras. One of the most important things to know is when was this era, right? And what is, for example, what defines the Middle Ages? Why 450 and 1450, you know? Uh, so we will get into those things, and I will consider them important. I do think it's important if you're studying something historically to know dates and know the significance of dates. Um, but not for this test. I'm not going to ask you to memorize this stuff for this test. So you can focus more on the elements. And this is just consider this as sort of like a, uh, a preview of what we're going to get into uh, for the rest of the semester.
Okay, I think that covers it for now. Uh, the next lecture is actually going to be about ancient music. And this is the one time, as I mentioned, if you looked on D2L, this is the one time where I am going to cover some material that is not covered in the book. The book does not deal with ancient music at all. That is music from before the Middle Ages. And I'll talk about the reasons for that. And we will have some test questions on ancient music. And this is going to be the one time in this course where I'm going to test you on a few things. There are going to be a handful of test questions on material that is not at all found in the book. So you'll definitely want to catch the next lecture. I might break it up into two shorter lectures because my phone has a hard time uh, downloading stuff uh, when, it, when it gets, or uploading to YouTube when it gets too long. So it, it might be two shorter lectures, but either way, that's going to be it before the test. I'm going to cover ancient music, and then we'll get into the test, and then we'll move on to our next unit. So, see you then.